Little thing that's a side note before I get into my sermon, I have to tell you about a story this week. Just to tell you about a story. Shh. Shh. So here's what happens. Because you guys, you all think I work just on Sunday and I get up here for, you know, the time that I preach and I teach classes and things. And you don't realize all the different things I do here and the ways I put my life on the line for you and your children. So what happened this week is, I think it was on, was it Friday, Mark? It was Friday. So Friday of this week, I'm just in my office. I went and got my wonderful meal at McDonald's, double cheeseburger meal, large size with a Coke. And I'd just gotten back to my office, and I was getting it all undone. And I took my first couple bites of my hamburger. And Guadalupe was here, which is our cleaner who cleans the church building. And during summertime, she has her kids with her. So one of the kids, as I'm eating, comes running into my office. And he's like, Scott, Scott. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, there's a snake. You got to come get it in the nursery. And I was like, there's a snake in the nursery, and you want me to get it? And he's like, yeah, mom found it, almost picked it up, and she needs you to come get it. And I'm thinking, dude, I don't get paid to do snakes, okay? <laughs> it's not, that's not my job. I clearly understand. I read my job title. I pulled it out, and I went, snakes are not in there, kid. Go figure it out. Um, so anyways, not a snake guy, but I, I realize I have to do what I can for this church. So um, I went and grabbed a broom, and I got a, a big garbage can, and I went down to the nursery, and about a 10-minute process, I was down there, and I found where he was, and I could see his little head, and then he got, like, underneath one of the uh, book little reading things, and he was under there, and I was trying to find a way to get him out. Now, this whole time, I was concerned because I have read enough, and I've seen enough that I knew if he, like, got up, at, reared up on me, and he got hold of part of me, he might be able to, like, wrap around me and strangle me and kill me, and so... I was scared to death that was going to happen, so I was trying to keep my distance so he couldn't strike. Um, and after about a 10-minute process, I was finally able to lure him in and slap him into the garbage can with the bag and then pull the bag out. And it wasn't one of those nice cloth ones where they can't see you. He can still see me. So I have the bag, and he's just in there, like, striking at me and trying to get me and all that stuff. And I, looking at it, I don't know how big pythons get, but this dude, he was at least... 8 to 10 inches, uh, and I think Mark, Mark was here to see it, and Mark said it was, I think he said it was a Gartner snake, and Rick informed me they're vicious, and so with that said, I just want you to know, if you pick up your, no, I want you to know, if you have children in the nursery today and you pick them up and they're alive, you can thank me afterwards, just saying, Okay. So feel free to say, thanks, Scott. My kids survived today. Thank you for getting the deadly snake out of the classroom. That's what I do, because I do everything around here to serve you as this church body, all right? So with that said, let's get on to our message for today. Uh, we are still in our sermon series of false assumptions uh, that will drive you crazy if you have them. What we've been doing, we've been simply looking at several false assumptions that Christians tend to have, whether they admit it or not, they're things that are subconscious, that they have that end up basically causing heartache and frustration in their walk with Christ instead of the life and the freedom that he desired for you to find. So we've been walking through these one by one. Now, how many of you are familiar with the organization Alcoholics Anonymous? How many of you have at least heard of that? Pretty much everyone's heard of them. They're pretty famous, uh, been around for years and years and years. Um, what they do is just simply this. They take people whose lives are being ruined by an addiction to alcohol, and they help them find a, a process to help them find recovery. And what they do is they typically, if you've ever been through it or know anything about it, they have what's called a 12-step process to help you find recovery. And the first thing they will always make you do if you go to Alcoholics Anonymous is the first thing they help you with is this, to admit that you actually have a problem, to identify it and admit that I'm an alcoholic. I have a problem. I have an addiction uh, to this thing called alcohol. Because what they want you to understand is this, without you understanding what your problem is, there is no way that you can achieve recovery. Um, you have to be able to know what the issue is. The other thing they will let you know is this, is that there is no cure for alcoholism, but there is recovery for the rest of your life from alcoholism. Um, and what they mean by that is this, um, you can find freedom from your addiction but your addiction will always be with you for the rest of your life looking to be triggered again by something, all right? So even though you can recover, you still have to be vigilant in protecting your future from that addiction. If you know a former alcoholic, what they will tell you, most of them, is I'm still an alcoholic and I won't touch a, a drink again. I just won't touch it. Why? Not because it's an absolute guarantee they will go back into the addiction, 
but they know it's a trigger. And so they stay away from that alcohol because they know it could possibly trigger them back into an addiction. So recovery for an alcoholic isn't necessarily something that ends. It's just a new place that they move to in their life. Um, that's what they teach them. Now, the reason I want you to understand that is this. We all have an addiction, okay? We all suffer from addiction. Now, when we hear the word addiction, we tend to kind of have a very narrow view of what that means. Let me tell you some of the things you probably think of when I say an addict or addiction. You probably are thinking alcoholics, um, or you're thinking drug addicts, or you're thinking pornography addicts, or you're thinking tobacco addicts, or you're thinking prescription pill addicts. And, and the minute I say addictions, you go through these several narrow-viewed things that you go, these are addictions. The reason we tend to classify some things as addictions and other things as not is because we want to avoid labeling ourselves as addicts. Um, no one likes to admit they're an addict. Um, even people that are to certain drugs like that hate to admit that they actually have a problem. What we like to do is this. We like to think they're addicts and I'm a decent person. They have problems. I don't. Their lives have been taken over by a substance. My life hasn't. And it makes us feel good about ourselves when we can view addiction that way. But today I want you to understand this. You're an addict. Um, so you can honestly admit to yourself what you are because the only way to get full recovery is to admit and start with the admittance process of going, yes, I'm an addict. Um, now, you might be saying to yourself, what am I an addict? I didn't know I was coming to church today to find out I'm an addict and I have an addiction. Um, very simply, we see this in Scripture. Most of you know what I'm going to say. It's this. You have an addiction to sin. Every one of us. We all have an addiction from sin. We grow up with it. Everybody on this planet grows up with an addiction to sin, and it continuously, uh, continually consumes more and more of us to the point that it starts to operate our lives and decide the decisions that we make in our lives, and it starts to consume us. Um, the Apostle Paul, I want to read to you, he gives a very descriptive, uh, detailed account of what this addiction looks like. Now understand, when Paul writes this in Romans 7, um, he is a Christian. He's been a Christian for probably at least two decades at this point, okay, a believer. Um, he is a changed man. He's been restored by Christ. But here's the words he writes about this addiction to sin. Here's how he says it. He says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave the sin. This is Paul. This guy's been a Christian a long time. And he says, I'm a slave to sin. He says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. What he's saying is, the fact that I know what I'm doing is wrong tells me I understand what God wants me to do is good. So he's going, that's how I know bad things versus good things is because I know Christ and Christ has taught me this is bad and this is good. And he says, so I am not the one doing the wrong. It is a sin living in me that does this. He says, and I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. So he's saying without Christ, nothing good lives in me. And I acknowledge that. Without Christ's presence in my life, there's nothing good in me. And he says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It's the sin living in me that does it. So he goes, it's this addiction. I don't want to do these things, but the sin in me continually is making me do this again and again. And he says, I've discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Then he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Then he concludes, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. 
Now, when you hear that and you read that up on the screen, how many of you can relate to Paul's troubles? Okay? He's describing, I think, what we all struggle with as believers in Jesus Christ. We want to be the person God calls us to be. But then there's us and the reality of us, which is we constantly get ourselves tied up in the things we know we shouldn't be doing. We want to do all these things for the kingdom of God. We want to do all these things that God calls us to do. We want to be responsive to his Holy Spirit. But then reality shows us rarely do we do that or too many times we don't do that. And it's like, why can't I ever get it straight? Why can't I ever figure it out? And that seems to be Paul, where he finally gets so frustrated, he says, what am I going to do? Oh, what a miserable person I am. And then he remembers there is a solution. It's through Jesus Christ. Thank God he's the one that rescues me from the sin and this death, this uh, constant situation I find myself in. Um, The reason I want you to understand why you can relate to this is this. It's because you're an addict. The reason you can read Paul's words from 2,000 years ago and read it and go, holy cow, that could be my story, is because you have an issue with sin that you need to admit you have an addiction to. It's just part of your DNA. Now, the false assumption I want to deal with today just says basically this, that one day you as a Christian will be recovered and you will no longer deal with sin. That at some point recovery just ends and it's finished and you no longer have to deal with the battle of sin in your life. That one day you can conquer these issues and they will never bother you again. The problem with this assumption is this, it's, you're just not being truthful with yourself. Um, when you think that you can get to a point that you no longer have to have recovery in this lifetime. You're not being truthful. Um, and believing this false assumption has very uh, spiritually harmful attitudes that come with it. Let me give you a few. Um, if you have this belief that someday you're going to conquer sin while you're here and you're no longer going to deal with it, that's no longer going to be a temp- temptation, it's not going to be a thing that controls you, um, the, what some of the mindsets are is this. One, you lose compassion for other people. Uh, one of the things that will happen to you is this. You will identify some things in your life you've overcome, and you'll look at others and go, why can't they overcome that? And they're just too weak. And you start to lose compassion for people. You see this. It's always a temptation, folks. For those of us that have been Christians for a long time, that God has worked through several addictions in our life and helped us overcome where they're no longer controlling in our life, to look at other people and go, I can't believe they're dealing with that same thing now. They're just weak. They're not giving full effort to it. And what happens is your heart becomes callous and you start to lose compassion towards other people. Another result of this false assumption can be this. You become prideful. You start to compare yourself to others and go, look at them and look at me. I'm a much better person than they are because I have a lot less things going on than they do. And it starts to create this this wellspring of pride within you, which is not a healthy thing. The other thing that happens, it can lead to despair in your life. And the reason it leads to despair is this. You are believing that there's a goal that you can achieve that can actually never be achieved. Uh, If you believe at some point you can rid yourself of any desires for sin, and that's an achievable thing in this life, when it's really not, all it will do is make you constantly feel like a failure every time you slip back into sin. And it becomes something uh, that you start to have despair for because you just start going, why can't I take care of this? And that you beat yourself up over and over again. Or the other possibility is you start to lie to yourself, which is this, you still have an addiction to sin, sin's still there in your life, but you just start denying it and go, it's not there because I don't want to think about it. And you start to deceive yourself willfully and lie to yourself willfully. But here's the thing. If we can never be done with recovery, to our addiction to sin, what do we do? Because to be honest with you, is that not kind of a depressing thought? Isn't it? Like for me to tell you, there is no hope that you can ever get over your addiction to sin in this lifetime. It becomes a very depressing thought when you hear that. So what do we do with that? Well, let me remind you of what Alcoholics Anonymous says in regards to recovery. They say this, recovery isn't a thing that ever ends but rather it's a new place that you move to in life. Uh, You just move to a different place in life. It doesn't mean those things still aren't there and sitting in the back of your head, but you move to a new place in life. Instead of keeping a scorecard of your sins that you have overcome and a scorecard of things that you have failed to overcome, we need to start looking at the recovery process from sin um, as a journey. 
we need to change kind of the words and the, wake up, or the makeup and how we view our struggle with sin. It's not a scorecard of I succeeded here and I failed here. Because to be honest with you, I think probably a lot of us do that. Do we not? Like you keep a scorecard and you go, these are the things I've conquered. These are the things I still struggle with. And you kind of have a scorecard and some days I'm good and some days I'm bad. And this day I'm passing the test and this day I'm not. And we keep the scorecard. And that's not real healthy. What we have to look at is our recovery from our addiction to sin is more of a journey. It's a process we go on. It's not a task list of accomplishments. It's not a test that we pass or fail, but rather it's a continual process of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's just a continual process that happens in our life. I believe we would be much more successful in our recovery process from sin if we learn to embrace the concept of a journey rather than thinking we are going to be constantly taking a test that we will pass or fail. Um, a journey, in general, is enjoyable. Would you not say that? Like, most journeys are enjoyable, all right? Most movies you watch that are good movies, they deal with some type of a journey. That's what you find. And most movies are built around some type of storyline where people are progressing somewhere. And the reason for that is in a journey, you have highlights, you have lowlights, you have successes, you have failures, but yet it's not a sad story overall because you know you're going somewhere. You know you're going to get to the end point at some point and you're going to achieve some type of a concept or to get to your goal. You know you're going to get there even though you have ups and downs and you have swings back and forth and you have successes and failures. You know those things and in a journey you're okay with that because you know you're getting somewhere. All right? The difference is, is this. How many of you ever enjoy taking a test? We have one one person in here enjoys taking a test. I don't know what's wrong with you, Lois. Um, but very few, if any, people enjoy taking a test. Uh, because all, at the best that you get out of it, is you take the test and it relieves some stress. And you can relieve stress. At the worst, if you're like me, you take most tests and you feel like a failure and people tell you you're a failure. Right? That's usually what happens with tests. That's why no one likes to take it. There's no good result. The good result is I pass and maybe I got an A and I pass it and now I feel like, oh, now I can stop worrying about it. I'm going, but that's not a good thing. You're just like, oh, I'm done with that. It's like a release. Or worse, you feel like a total failure. And that's how we view our spiritual walk a lot of times. It's like this constant test. And it hurts our view of God. It hurts how we view God. And it makes us feel like failures more often than not. And so we have to change our concept of recovery to being a journey, not a test, okay? God's not going to come to you and go, here's a test. You check the things you did well and check the things you did wrong, and we'll see how they compare. Jesus invites you onto a journey. Take this journey with me. Um, Paul, the same guy who described the addiction, also describes in pretty good detail this journey concept. Um, if you go to Philippians chapter 3, he says this in verses 12 through 14. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. So prior to this passage here, he's talking about all the things he's done, the goal that Christ has for us. And he starts off by letting him know, I'm not saying I've achieved all these things. I haven't. I'm still struggling with them. And so he says, I haven't reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So then he says, I haven't achieved these things, but that doesn't mean that I don't keep striving to reach that goal Christ has put before me, which is perfection. I, I haven't stopped striving for that, even though I fail constantly, I haven't met perfection, I continue on the path, I continue the journey. And he says this, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on and I, to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through, Je or through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So Paul, through this, goes, I see this as a journey. Have I reached the end of it yet? No, I haven't. But let me tell you how I get through this journey and how I keep going on. He says, I've learned this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race. What Paul says is this. I've had failures. I've had down times. I've had times I've let God down. I've had times I've let people down. Um, I'm reading in this, but he's going, I've done all those things, and what I have to do is this. 
yeah, I did, and I need to forget about those things out, and I need to move on. I need to keep pressing forward. I cannot spend all my time back here worrying about how I failed, 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 because I failed, and it's over with, and I can't change that. So what I have to do is I have to continue to press on to be the person Christ is calling me to be from this moment forward, and I have to let the other stuff just stay in the past and realize it happened, hopefully learn from it, like we talked a few weeks ago, learn from it, but I can't continue to dwell on it, because if I continue to dwell on it, I won't keep moving forward. And he says, and that's what Christ has called me to. Christ has called me to a, uh, to a place. God, Christ has called me to an end place. That end place is living a Christian life devoted to Jesus Christ until the day of your death. And you are on a journey until you get to that place. All right? Um, so when will we, uh, so if we will never be finished with recovery uh, to our addiction to sin in this life, will we ever? No, you never will be finished with it. Never, ever, ever. But that doesn't mean you failed the test with God. Uh, what it means is that you're on a journey with him. Um, you will get off target, okay? Every one of you in here, you will get off target. You will have low lights. You will have failures. You will have things that you are ashamed of. You don't want to tell other people. And when you're on a journey, you know what you do with that? When that happens, you make a course correction and you get back on track. That's what you do. It happened it's now in the past. Now I make a course correction, and I continue on the journey. That's how you handle that. At the same time in this journey, you will have times where you have successes. You overcome things. You have incredible highlights of your journey with Jesus Christ. And you know what you do with that? You don't sit there and praise yourself about how good you are. What you do is you sit back and you praise God for how good he is for the work he's doing in your life and the grace that he grants you to have those moments in spite of some of your uglier ones. When you're on a journey, that's how you handle the successes. We're on a journey as individuals. We're also on a journey as a group of people to continually be transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. That's what our recovery is. It's a journey as an individual with God and it's a journey as a church together to become more and more like Jesus Christ in every way of our life. And the way I see it is this. It's an incredible honor we have to be on a journey with God in this way, to become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. It's an honor. It's not a burden. It's an honor. Christ wants you to understand. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's something that should renew your life day in and day out, not be a burden where you go, I'm constantly failing the test of recovery. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to journey in this life with you. I thank you for the opportunity as a fallen person, as a person who's addicted to sin, um, but also a person who's on the road to recovery. Um, Father, for the opportunity to let you walk alongside us. That, Father, I have an idea and I, I know you are taking me to a specific place. And eventually I know my final destination and that's with you and your kingdom someday. So, Father, may we learn to embrace this journey not to see it as a burden of a scorecard of rights and wrongs, as failures or successes, but, Lord, a journey where we walk alongside you in this life, knowing that you never walk away from us, you never leave us, you are always there by our side in our good times and our bad times and our successes and our failures and our highlights and in our lowlights. You are always there with us, walking alongside us in this journey. So, Father, may we embrace it. May we desire it. May we understand we will never recover from this addiction of sin while we are here in these bodies, these earthly bodies. So, Father, we are no better than any other person, no better than anyone else. We just are walking with you, which changes our perspective and it changes our eternal destination. So, Father, thank you for that. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your commitment to us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.